you see this thing going? Like, how big do you want it to be? His answer was, eh, if 3,500 to 5,000 people check for it, I'm happy. And I literally sat quiet and in my head I laughed. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series, in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit the like button. John Robinson, aka Lil Psy, debuted with his crew Signs of Life in 1996 and since has released more than 20 albums and countless collabs worldwide. The South Bronx born, Far Rock Queens, and New Jersey raised MC's extensive catalog still resonates worldwide. As John Robinson evolves, he continues to enterprise his music career and grow as a creative entrepreneur in the intersection of music, culture, education, and tech. I spoke to John Robinson about his brother ID Forwins, with who he formed Signs of Life. If you are into my illustrations, please check out my illustration book Accolades, which you can still get on CrateRecords.be. This is what John Robinson had to add. My brother and partner in music, and mainly because, you know, he had a family early and he didn't get to travel and do as much as I was able to do. But a lot of what I was able to do was driven off of the work he put in, the music, all the stuff we did early. And then even now, I, I consider him like the best kept secret. He's my brother, older brother of two years, but he's, he's a genius with this shit and he doesn't get the props and the accolades that he should. And I just feel like he's competing with the best of them or better, you know? And a lot of times I hear shit and see shit and I'm like, I don't have to hear my bro, though, you know? And we're finally coming back around. Like this year, we're celebrating 25 years since our first Bible in 1997. And we're finally coming back around to making music together. And it's just coming together so easily and so seamlessly. And I've missed that chemistry, you know? Sometimes you don't always think like, yeah, I could work with this person and that person, but this is my brother. And we've been doing music since sense made sense, you know, and it's a thing where, you know, I'd start to reflect several years ago, I realized how much I learned from him, you know, in terms of my own technique, my own strategy, my own mindset, and how I think of the music and how I study the music and, you know, just um, really being a, a fan of the music and artists, but a student of the game for lack of a better expression, like really studying the field, being up on who's who, except that's how we started. We knew if it was dope and it was in the world, we knew about that shit, you know, or we knew someone who put us on to it and that's how it began. But to fast forward it, I mean, I, I just feel like he's still making some of the dopest beats on a high level and some of the dopest rhymes, you know, and just very versatile and very masterful and quick. And I never really admit this to him, but when we're in the studio, I'm like, fuck, I gotta, I gotta play catch up. Like, I, and I don't know if it was because he hasn't really been putting so much music out for public consumption and he's just kind of been in this zone. But yeah, when we create together, I'm looking at him like, shit, you're finished? You're like, whoa, you know? So that would be, and even when I thought of the concept, that was the first name and person I thought of just because it's real to me. What thing of him is the, the thing that somebody should check out, first of all, out of yeah. thing, just to get a, an, an idea of, of, of what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know what? We have, we have a song called Yikes, Signs to Life, Yikes. And it actually features, bless his soul, it features MF Doom. You know, the reason I chose that song is because it was a song we did like circa 2001. And it was when my brother was really coming into his production and starting to get this sound that we were like, yo, that's, that's the soul, that's the jazz, that's the vibe we're looking for. And we tested it out by going to Doom's studio and push and play on the beat. And he's like, yo, I want to get on this one. And I'm like, and I already knew. I'm like, yo, you're really coming into this sound. And our whole vibe was, you know, we listen to jazz music. We listen to soul music. And 
our approach was to celebrate the music that came before us. Like come with a sound that's our touch, but celebrate the music. Don't let it die. Don't let the legacy just wither away. But that was a song that not only just to me felt like, okay, he reached a new level of production, but even his rhyme on there, you know, just a classic rhyme, classic joint. And at the time, we were we were all studying and making beats and you know because we didn't we didn't start producing and recording ourselves till about 99 um and this is a couple years after our first vinyl and i felt like at that point literally me and a third partner stepped away from the beats and said you know what you should just produce the beats mostly we'll add our input and that's what we kind of just how how was the how was the vibe like uh, early two thousands uh, in New York? Like I I can imagine like coming after that first generation in the, in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah, little hard to like keep pushing like that. It, was that was that all over the place or 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 was that kind of hip hop still popping? Uh, uh, you know what? It was it was an interesting time, right? Because it was for the independent. It was still a time where you could partner with a smaller label and get your music to the world. You know, distribution was still popping. People were still going into retail stores and buying physical products. And I felt like the shows was the driving force. Um, the first time we traveled internationally was May 2000, we toured Italy. Mm -hmm. But we not only toured Italy, bless his soul, we got booked by phase two original wild style graffiti artists. And this is someone that we never met before, but we grew up in the same neighborhood in the Bronx, but never met him. And it was magical because, you know, he's an older guy and about the third day, he admitted to us, he said, yo, I think I know your family. And he started naming fucking family members. And it was just like, <laughs> well, you know, it blew our minds, but- Was, was Doom, was Doom is big? Uh, back then, as he is now, or do you think he got uh, bigger by by the legend ar that grew around him? Put it like this: it's it's so ironic, right? Doom. I remember the, sitting with him at an interview, and this was two thousand one, two thousand two, and we were in Atlanta at the time. So when we made that song, I'm talking about we all lived in Atlanta. Doom as well, and. He was in this interview and they asked him, they said, so, I mean, where do you see this thing going? Like, how big do you want it to be? His answer was, eh, if 3,500 to 5,000 people check for it, I'm happy. And I literally sat quiet and in my head I laughed and said, are you kidding me? 3,500? I was like, bro, that's more like 3 million. Like, you know, come on, man. But it, it, it showed me in that instance, like, wow, this guy is really reserved in his space where he's not even thinking about the limelight. And in the same interview, he explains that the mask literally means forget image, forget what I look like and all that fancy stuff. Just listen to the music. You don't need to know about the image, but I mean, ironically- I mean, I mean, if, you listen, if you listen to Monster Island Czars, for instance, is like, it's so fucking weird 90s rap while it came out in like what 2001 or whatever like it so it's it's like yeah he, he definitely did whatever he wanted to do that's that that's what i think that's what's appealing to him as well or so yeah i would say once this is what i feel like was the the incline was kind of the mask right he said that and what it meant the following year, his face with the mask on was on about nine different magazine covers, like the next year. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that, that idea of shut down image became the biggest image, right? Still, it's like iconic. You look at that mask and you say MF Doom before you say Dr. Doom from Marvel. Like he took yeah, over that yeah, shit. Sure. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I felt like we were also held up by like certain classic hip hop that just never died down and it's still going, you know? And it was- It's crazy thing. It's crazy to see the, the increase of, of, uh, of rap records again, like especially like 90s and early 2000s. 
Like I remember a time when we were making music in the beginning, like vinyl sales went backwards <laughs> around like 2008, 2009. And then like, it all of a sudden, like five years ago, it all of a sudden went back, which is so fucking awesome to see. Oh, uh, it's, it's, yeah. Sometimes it's unbelievable. I see some of the numbers with vinyl sales and I'm like, no, nah, that's not true. And then I do my research like, wow, these, you know, these vinyl records. And I guess it's, it's that psychological thing, right? You take some shit away or if you make me feel like I can't have it, I'm going to go for it more now, you know? And numbers, like how, how, how should I see that? Like how many vinyl of your first? Yeah, I feel like the first albums, um, well, the first vinyl, like the 12 inches came out on um, Fine Millum Records. Mm -hmm. The label started by Bobito from Stretch On Sean and Bobito Radio Show. We were surprised by the success of it, actually, because, you know, it's it's a 12-inch vinyl. We're thinking more, we're not going to make a bunch of money off this. This is about getting our name out and promotions and, you know, starting to do shows. But as I remember, shoot, we might have read up for both records like three times, three different represses. You know, he's handwriting the accounting, showing us the numbers, handing us checks. And we're like, oh, shit. So I would say it's safe to say those first vinyls, I would say about eight to 10,000 copies each. That's you know? Yeah. And this was a time where personally, I feel like because of, um, because of the time and the era, but more so because of the international appeal, especially because Stretch Armstrong and Bobito radio show was kind of boutique to the New York tri-state area but then tapes started to circulate. People would record the shows. There was a lot of people in the military going back to Germany with the tapes and, you know, Japan, et cetera. So these tapes start to travel. And then before you know it, by the time we got to Europe, it was like people knew us already because of those first records. And like, oh, hell yeah, stretch and ball, lyrics is loud, you know? And I, I gotta give a shout out to Bobito, the lyrics is loud. Of course, is that, is, that, is that the area that you that you like were really like yeah. stuff was that most deaf like the, all those guys like that that that, that, yeah. that was that like I'm actually on the volume one out the lyricist lounge volume one. Oh, are you? Oh, okay, I didn't even know that. There's a there's a skip called outside the lounge and it's a freestyle with um, Talib Kweli, Shabam Sadiq, um, Mr. Metaphor, Wise Guy, and some other folks. I was 16 or 17 when that came out, and I remember that was like one of the biggest records that year. That lyricist oh, yeah. record was like everything we wanted to hear <laughs> when it came out. And it was just the aesthetic, right? Even looking at the cover, the colors, the oh, yeah. art. For me, it was like it, it, it turned into like the Fun Crusher Plus album from uh, Company Flow and all that stuff. I'm glad you said Company Flow because I can't not mention them. For Two main reasons. The first one, when we first, we heard them on the radio show, Stretch and Bob, before we had any deal or record or anything. And I remember hearing them loving just like the complexity of the deliveries and just the dynamics of the beat. It was just, it blew our minds, right? Mm -hmm. Back when we went to buy the vinyl, right? Their first vinyl, we pick up the vinyl in the store and the first thing I saw at the bottom of the vinyl, it said independent as fuck. And that never left me. That never left. It was like, this is the way. That record got me into making music. Yeah. The, the second reason I got to shout out Cold Flow, Big Just. Oh, man. Big Just is the Big best. Just helped us put out our first two albums, right? And our first two albums was on a label that he started called Subverse Music. But that label, yes, yeah, Subverse, that label's also the label that re-released Operation Doomsday and put out Black Bastards KMD for the first time. Oh, really? Wow, okay. I, I felt know. like that, period, we were all here in Atlanta, that started to take Doom to the next level because not only did Operation Doomsday just get more light and press and media, you know, because Bobito put it out first on Final One, but Bob's outlook was more fuck promotion, let people find the music. We're not doing that extra shit with flyers and stuff. Fuck all that shit. Put the music out, let people find it. 
But Subverse was more like, you know what? If we're going to re-release this thing, let's go hard. Let's go hard on press. Let's tell the backstory. And I felt like because people were able to connect the dots to Doom's Operation Doomsday, but also go further to this unreleased, never heard before Black Bastards KMB controversial album that got them dropped from the major label because yeah, of the yeah, cover. Yeah. The cover, yeah. It just, it just brought like the story together and I felt like the people who were paying attention, yeah, just fell in love with the fact that, wow, like this cat went through all of this and he reinvented himself as this and he's still pushing through. We got his back. So I, I feel like at the time, yeah, Big Just did a lot but the last time I talked to him was maybe three or four months ago, and he was working on this project called NMS. Oh yeah, I know NMS. Yeah, he he, he was doing that back in the day as well. All right. He got a new one with Orko. LP with the with Killer Mike. At first, it was like, how's that gonna work? Like, I'll be honest, that's how I felt in the beginning. Like, really? How how these guys even meet? But then when that first album dropped, I was like, ah. This is how it worked. And then it, it reminded me, like, yeah, you know what? LP does have that producer mindset of, I hear something, let's go. You know, he's been that guy pretty yeah. much over it. He hears shit, puts it together. I mean, that's how I felt about Cannibal Ox, right? Exactly. You, know, yeah. you heard that Cold Vein album, you were like, oh, this is some other shit. Like, oh. Cold Vein, Cold Vein is insane. Like, that album is so fucking crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. He just, for us, he changed our lives. Seriously, this is how I remember because he gave us our first deal for albums. But when we got the advance money, prior to that, we didn't know why, but he used to take us to all the equipment stores over and over again to look at shit. And the, but we were window shopping, right? So it didn't feel good after a while because. The people in the store started to know you and said, ah, oh, these guys aren't buying anything and they would treat you a certain way. But when we got the money for the events, he sat us down and he said, okay, cool. Now you guys got some resources to work with. You can do this. You could go to any of the classic hip hop big studios in New York, order food, have parties and have a grand old time with your friends and record one album. Or... You could take a third of that money, go to those fucking equipment stores we've been going to, buy all the equipment that you know you wanted and need to do what you do, and record forever. Mm -hmm. What should you do? And of course we chose that option. And Tom, when I tell you that was probably one of the greatest feelings in the world, to walk in those same stores with a fucking big cart, moving through the store, pointing to shit the salesman like no we got the cheaper on sale no we want that shit we want this we want and walking to the counter paying for the shit with the card loading the van and driving home to set shit up that was the most amazing thing but he's also always been that guy and he's still that guy about 12 years ago i ran into just after not really seeing him for a while and he was like, yo, man, it's all about content, bro. We got to be filming shit. Car no, companies need content. People need co content. going to control. If you got content and you control it, you're going to be a god in this shit. Then they're going to At the time, Tom, we're like, what are you talking about, bro? What content about? This is before Instagram or any of that shit. And he's just like, nah, con it's it. I'm telling you how it goes together. People are going to just be using content to just get data and dirt and he's saying all this high level shit and we're like, huh? But before that, in 1998, he said, no, if we're not moving to bring direct to consumer to us to purchase the music from us directly and erasing the middleman, then what do we do? And it changed our whole mindset entering in to be independent. We were on the phones. I was the radio guy. So I was talking to the DJs and just said, yo, when they hear you and they know it's you, it's going to be different because no one does it. They hire someone to do that shit. It's you. You're going to call the record stores and do the retail shit. And when they know it's you, and at that point, Tom, after about a year, I literally knew by name 
damn near every retail vinyl buyer in the country. That's awesome, man. Her name. So he he just showed us the blueprint. But the crazy part about it is, personality wise, just is so shy. You'll never really see him in the forefront shining these things or talking his shit. He's more of the background professor scientist who just has these fucking futuristic thoughts. So now you know what I do? When he talks, I fucking shut up and listen. No matter how crazy it sounds, I listen, I write shit down because he's proven to me, oh no, this guy's on some shit. I want to thank John Robinson for this conversation. On next week's episode, I'm talking to Tom from the punk band, The Cool Greenhouse, about Ben Wallers. Thanks for listening, watching, or however you check out accolades. Give us a thumbs up or follow our channel. See you next week.